Hi, I'm Owen Astrakhan from Duke University, and I'm here to talk with you about AP Computer Science principles, and in particular, while computing innovations are typically designed to achieve a specific purpose, they may have unintended consequences. So I'm going to tell a few stories about that and try to make sure it relates to the computer science principles course that many of you are enrolled in. First, I'm talking about computing and computer science, and I want to make a couple of things clear about what these are. Computing and computer science are changing our world. And this is true in every country, in every state, in every town, in every house. It's just true. It's amazingly true. And this change is accelerating. Computing is faster, it's cheaper, it's bigger. And this is more due to cloud computing, perhaps, than it is to parallel and distributed computing. And it's also true because computers are everywhere, as we're going to see. Now, the view I'm taking today is largely in the United States. Most AP exams are given in the United States, but it's true throughout the world as well. Much of this increase and change in computing and computer science is due to how ubiquitous computers are and how we are able to access them. This is a picture of the room in my house where we do computing, where I teach Zoom classes when I'm teaching classes at Duke, where I have family time, where we're working right now on Zoom. We have a lot of monitors and we have a lot of books. But who has a computer and what is a computer? We're going to have to understand these to try to understand some of the issues related to beneficial and harmful effects. Do you use that computer for pleasure, for home, for work? And the answer to this is probably yes to all of them. And who is affected by? access to computing and using computers that's going to be everyone but some people have more access than others and that's an issue to make sure that we understand something about how computer science is involved not just technology i'd like to use this as my working definition of computer science it is the study of automating algorithmic processes that scale now all these terms are things that you'll become more familiar with as you explore and become curious about computer science principles but the key aspects of it are automating that's the programming part the algorithmic processes we're going to make sure we understand that and the scale because we really need to use concepts of computer science when we're addressing thousands or millions or billions or trillions of data elements and people computer science is not simply limited to programming and it's not simply limited to science, technology, engineering, and math. It encompasses all areas of study in interesting ways. When I mention access to computing, I wanna highlight one of the enduring understandings from the computer science principles course and exam description, which is the unintended consequences of computing and computer science, but access to the internet and computing differs by socioeconomic status, for example. Let's see how that works and why the beneficial and harmful effects might be both mitigated by and expanded by this digital divide. Smartphones and the internet, it turns out, according to many data sources, that there are roughly 276 million smartphones in the United States. And if you look at recent census data, it turns out that there are about 332 million people in the United States and about 60 million people under 15. And if you do the math on 332 minus 60, you'll get right at 276 million, which means perhaps everybody in the United States over 15 has a smartphone. Now, that's not exactly right, but the math lends us, leads us to think that most people in the United States have a smartphone. Now, does that mean that most people in the United States are on the internet? And the answer to that is probably no, but what is a smartphone? We call it a smartphone, but it really is a computer. And here's some words from a source and all the words that I use on my slides, I include the source in case you'd like to explore that in more depth. Smartphones are supercomputers or at least they're significantly more powerful than supercomputers were 10 years ago, and way more powerful than desktops were five years ago. Now, as an example of how this works, 
there's an IBM Blue Gene computer, and I've included a link to the Wikipedia page so that you could see what this looks like. It's a room full of big and fast computers. The IBM Blue Gene was among the first computers that beat a world chess champion, roughly in 2007. And apparently our smartphones are as powerful, powerful or more powerful than that supercomputer. So in our hands, those of us who have smartphones, which is almost everybody, have access to a very powerful computer. That has great beneficial effects, but perhaps some unintended consequences as well. Because it turns out that because a smartphone is small and because it may not be connected to the internet using fast internet connections, it may not give us everything we want in a computer. So here's a headline that says 59% of US parents with lower incomes say their child may face digital obstacles in schoolwork. It's not so easy to do your homework on your phone. Do local, state, and federal governments have a responsibility to ensure internet connections for all? It turns out that in the United States, all schools, public, private, charter, have access to what's called a governmental E-rate that allows them to get fast internet at the school for a relatively reasonable cost. And there are some people that think perhaps that would be a good idea for all families to have because the internet is important. How important? That's something for you to explore. And I'm gonna mention a few things. In the United States, poverty levels are, as you can see on this slide, a certain level, depending on how big your family is, it turns out that 16% of the children in the United States live in poverty. And that for a family of four, if you make or have access to income below $26,500, perhaps you live in a state of poverty. Most people don't live in poverty in the United States, but many do. And before COVID hit, fewer people were in poverty than in years previous because the economy was doing well. However, because of changes due to COVID, we need more access to the internet and we have less access to the internet. The internet is not inexpensive. You can see here that in Atlanta, a month of broadband internet access costs $105, whereas in Los Angeles, it's only $49. Now, those differences are regional, but perhaps they should be differences that are changed by ensuring that everybody can access the internet inexpensively. That's something that is being explored in some areas of different states in different countries. Right now in the United States, 75% of all homes have access to the internet that's fast. Now that means that 25%, that's a significant number, don't. So this digital divide is part of our, is part of the issue relating to beneficial and harmful effects of computing and the internet. Because as it turns out, the internet is reasonably important. I mentioned that in this current crisis due to the pandemic, many people are working from home. The internet at home makes a huge difference to being able to work successfully at school or successfully at work. Uh, essential workers are those that go in some people get to work at home, often facilitated by the internet. Some people, including the United Nations, believe that the internet is a basic human right. And you can see here that in 2016, the United Nations affirms that the internet is an important component of human rights, including freedom of expression, freedom of association, privacy, and other human rights online. These are important characteristics of computing and computer science, because without computing and computer science, we wouldn't have an internet. The internet is also allowing us to access information very quickly. We can see here again from that same United Nations report that the UN affirms the importance of applying a human rights-based approach to expanding access to the internet and requests all states, meaning countries, to make efforts to bridge the many forms of digital divide. So this digital divide concept is across the world and important in many constituencies. 
because we want to be able to use the internet to do good things. Now, those good things sometimes have a harmful effect. We can see here, again, from the computer science principles course and exam description, that while computing innovations are typically designed to achieve a specific purpose, they may have unintended consequences. And we'll see a few examples of that in exploring how computing works. Here's a beneficial effect in the Atlanta airport that's new this year in 2020. The Atlanta airport is testing facial recognition and contactless technology. That's important in COVID times because of the contactless nature, but it's also true because it's going to improve travel time. If you don't have to stop and have somebody look at your license, for example, if you travel, but it's simply a way of using facial recognition, you will be able to travel more seamlessly, more efficiently, and more cheaply. We can see here that different airlines are using facial recognition to make travel better. But that same facial recognition, which was designed to have a beneficial effect, can have a harmful effect. Also in Atlanta, as it turns out, Google is using facial recognition to perform many of the tasks that are done by computing and computer science. And the people that were hired by Google to improve their facial recognition system got into some difficulty and some trouble because they paid homeless people to have their faces used as part of training these facial recognition systems and didn't tell the truth about what they were doing, making it, making it seem like we will pay you to have your picture taken, not making it clear that those pictures were going to be used for facial recognition training. So that caused some issues with Google's facial recognition training, which was a harmful effect. That same machine learning that was used in the facial recognition is also part of what's used in so-called personal digital assistants like Siri and Alexa. And depending on what kind of phone you have, you may have access to Cortana or Bixby. There are the other digital assistants that help you. In my house, we have one and we can say, Alexa, play this music. It's very handy. You don't have to get up and go turn something on. You can also order things online. They're, they're very handy, these digital assistants, but are they improving things for everybody? And how do they work? How do they get to listen to my voice and then respond more quickly to other people's voices? It turns out that these devices get better at what they do because of artificial intelligence and machine learning that's happening in the cloud as well as on the device itself. So when you speak to your smartphone and you use your voice and it recognizes you, that's your phone doing some computing, but often it has to go to the cloud to do that as well. And these beneficial effects of being able to talk to your phone also have potential harmful effects due to privacy concerns. We can see some headlines of Alexa and Siri and other dis devices having a darker side because of potential privacy concerns where information is leaked because of how they work. If it was only on your device and didn't have access to the internet, it would be a simpler measure to keep it private. But because it has access to the outside, there are privacy concerns. Again, we see those beneficial and harmful effects. These same effects with machine learning also have an example in computing bias. So we're going to see a couple of examples of how that bias works and how understanding it is important in doing computing and computer science to benefit everybody. One place you can find more information is at the aptly named Algorithmic Justice League, AJL.org. And they say on their website that they combine art and research to illum illuminate the social implications and harms of AI. They also recognize the benefits of AI. And they say that technology should serve all of us, not just the privileged few. Join the Algorithmic Justice League in the movement towards equitable and accountable AI, because they recognize that there are great reasons to have artificial intelligence, but those benefits should be 
constrained in some ways, perhaps, when they have harmful effects. This algorithmic bias and data bias is often at play in machine learning. The way machine learning and deep learning work is because they get trained and they improve their knowledge by learning. And remember, these are computer programs by processing huge amounts of data. Siri and Alexa are some examples. The facial recognition system in the Atlanta airport is another example. But we can also see that deep learning is helping to save endangered zebras by recognizing the stripes on the zebras. So deep learning and machine learning have a huge range of applications, not simply limited to the devices in our hands and not simply limited to understanding how humans work, but across science, social science and humanities, deep learning and machine learning have an important impact. But we need to recognize the bias that may come from data that's not representative of everybody. And that leads to legal and ethical concerns, where, again, we can see perhaps some of these unintended consequences. GPT-3 is an AI, artificial intelligence, API, application programming interface. So some people have access to this huge, deep machine learning application where you can use it to train an application that you want to train. The designers of this open AI system made it available as an API, meaning some people, not everyone, have access to its technology. They decided not to make it an open source technology, another topic that you will study more in computer science principles, because once it's open source, anybody can use it for anything. But because of ethical concerns, the open AI group and organization decided to only make the API available depending on how you want to use it and who you are. Even that has some potential beneficial and harmful effects, but releasing it to anyone for any purpose might make it difficult to stop unethical AI. And there's a reference here to a recent article that explores how to determine what is ethical and what is unethical when it comes to artificial intelligence and computer science. This deep learning and AI, which is behind so much of the innovation online, comes at a cost. And that cost isn't simply limited to ethics, but includes power consumption. It turns out that there is a carbon emission problem, that there is a power limit in deploying machine learning because training these algorithms, which include billions and trillions of parameters to understand the data, require days or weeks or months of running huge warehouses of computers 24 seven. So the cost of training an algorithm like that open AI algorithm is immense in terms of money, but also immense in terms of the electrical power used to train the algorithm. And it's only because of using the cloud and because of how big these programs are that are doing artificial intelligence that the cost and the potential environmental impact is felt. That leads to another potential drawback of using the internet for ubiquitous communication, which is that it's possible that depending on how you use the internet, you might not be able to. We can see here some headlines where it turns out that some companies control a lot of the access to the internet, especially because of the cloud, where most of the computing happens, and especially because of smartphones where most of the computing happens. We've already seen how widespread phone use is. And it turns out that these companies can make it difficult for some social media companies to stay online. And you can follow these links if you want to learn more about how Parler was taken offline because Amazon decided they weren't going to support it in the cloud and because Apple and Google decided that they weren't going to support it in their app store. So the power to control things brings policy, legal, and ethical concerns to the forefront as you study computer science. There is so much to do with computer science and 
programming and understanding algorithms and every other part of computer science principles. I hope that you will continue to explore these things on your own. And thank you for allowing me to be with you.